Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, especially given the weather in my former home, uh, Boston. These are my disclosures before I start. Um, looks like a lot. It's in the spirit of over-disclosure and transparency, and I believe they didn't affect the content of the uh, talk, but you can make up your own mind now. So if we talk about chest pain, we have to consider the many different flavors of chest pain, and they would um, result in very different clinical approaches or imaging. Um, so I'll start with the big three acute chest pain syndromes that you might encounter. Um, there is the acute coronary syndrome, which would be an acute MI or STEMI, uh, non-ST elevation MI or unstable angina pectoris, red posternal chest pain. The acute aortic syndrome, which is the aortic dissection, intramural hematoma or penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. And the venous thromboembolism syndrome, which is really PE and slash or deep venous thrombosis. So the patients would present, of course, differently in a textbook. Um, in real life, sometimes um, there's a lot of overlap in the symptoms, but retrosternal chest pain would be for, for the acute coronary syndrome. Pleuritic chest pain is what we typically um, uh, consider uh, associated with pulmonary embolism. Um, and tearing chest pain between the shoulder blades would be leading you along the path of aortic pathology, such as a dissection. Um, there are, however, non-acute uh, syndromes uh, uh, that are associated with chest pain, and they can affect every tissue that exists in the chest. The myocardium, for example, typically myocarditis, chest pain two weeks after a viral infection, for example. A pericardial, as in pericarditis. Pulmonary pneumonia would be a big differential to all of the um, other uh, entities we uh, named, plural with the pneumothorax. In the mediastinum, you could have GERD, gastroesophageal reflux, and of course, maybe at a social disagreement a week ago, got punched in the chest, and you know, you have that chest pain. It's often a differential diagnosis to an acute MI um, in the emergency room. So let's start with PE, or venous thromboembolism, which is PE and deep venous thrombosis. Um, the role of ultrasound in acute chest pain is somewhat limited. Uh, maybe in DVT, ultrasound has its biggest role because it would be considered the reference standard to exclude lower extremity um, deep venous thrombosis. Um, the advantage is it's non-invasive, relatively low cost. There's no radiation associated with this, and it's usually readily available. You will have technologists in-house in any major medical centers 24-7. It is dynamic. So for the heart, you could look at cine images and even for the lower extremities. The disadvantages when it comes to the thorax is that uh, in order to see most of the order, you would have to do a transesophageal <coughs> scan, which is very invasive, and you don't see all of the order. You definitely don't see all of the pulmonary artery. Actually, as a matter of fact, you don't see any of the pulmonary arteries that are out in the lung because air doesn't allow the ultrasound to travel. Um, and the success is dependent on the person doing it and the body habitus of the patient. Um, this is just some neat features you can see. If you have a good technologist and a good patient, you can see the valves in the superficial femoral vein. Um, but what we usually do is some um, color Doppler. You would look for a filling defect. You can get dynamic information. Somebody squeezed the calf, and you can see that the flow is faster here. That tells you there's no clot between where you squeezed and where you were looking. So flow um, uh, evaluation is an advantage of CT. Now, um, again, those appropriateness criteria. I've, uh, uh, 789 is a green light, basically usually appropriate. For pulmonary embolism, CT of the thorax is appropriate, whether you are an adult um, or an adult who is pregnant. Um, CTA thorax and the lower extremity uh, which we had been experimenting with in medicine is considered um, uncertain, certainly not appropriate, or not, usually not appropriate in pregnancy because you could replace the lower extremity CT venogram with that ultrasound that has no radiation. Um, and echocardiography really um, doesn't have a, a role here. And you also note MRI is absent. The PIOPET 3 trial showed us that it is not a good modality for pulmonary um, embolism detection. Now, CT also comes with additional benefits. Um, it will allow you to get uh, risk factors that other tests can give you, like a VQ scan. You can identify the most proximal level of your pulmonary embolism. Does it go, is it just segmental? Does it go lobar, or is it maybe a saddle embolus? The risk is higher uh, the more proximal you go. 
Um, there is an, an index you could create, how many of your pulmonary arteries are um, obstructed, but a very easy metric is the right ventricle to left ventricle ratio. Simple measurement of how wide the diameter of the ventricles are. If it is above 1.4, it has been associated with a severely decreased prognosis or poorer prognosis. Um, and then there's other signs of right ventricular strain that are associated with uh, poor prognosis, such as straightening um, of the septum. Here's just an example. So um, a VQ scan would probably also pick up that um, these are obstructed pulmonary arteries where there's clot within them. We also know that there's wedge-shaped peripheral opacities, which tell us there, uh, it's, uh, that there's an infarct that we usually don't get with a PE because of that dual blood supply the pulmonary arteries themselves, but then also the bronchial arteries that prevent an infarct from happening. But sometimes we do get infarcts. And if you look at the right ventricle here, it's much larger a distance than the left ventricle. So the ratio here is increased more than 1.4 to 1. So there's RV strain. There's also flattening of the ventricular septum. So there's a lot of risk factors that help you assess the prognosis in this patient compared to other patients with pulmonary embolism. The diameter of the pulmonary artery can increase markedly, in this case of chronic uh, PE, and again, uh, a case of RV strain. Um, there are um, other guideline documents um, when it comes to imaging of the aorta and the coronary arteries. They're often multi-society guidelines. They all came together um, to figure out what the best patient management is, including imaging. This is one from the American College of Radiology, which we've heard a lot about, but also the American College of Cardiology, the AHA, and a number of other societies. And it's about imaging of the aorta in the acute setting and in the non-acute setting. And they have class one um, and two and three indications. Class one is the strongest indication you can get or recommendation. And they say that urgent and definitive imaging of the aorta using transesophageal echo CT or MRI is is recommended to identify or exclude thoracic aortic dissection in patients that are high risk for that. They, a class three means this is not indicated or contraindicated. A negative chest X-ray means nothing. Um, you can't exclude a dissection or acute aortic injury, so don't uh, just do a chest X-ray. But then they go uh, further to say selection of an imaging mortality to identify or exclude aortic dissection should be based on patient variables. Okay, like body habitus and uh, maybe acuity, institutional capabilities, including immediate availability. And this is critical. If you have a guy standing there with the echo probe and somebody to do the anesthesia, to do a TEE right away, then you could do that to rule out aortic dissection. Um, but usually this is a slower test and it's very invasive. MRI is an, a possible test, but MR itself takes a long time. Um, so in most hospitals, the most immediately available test for aortic dissection, for acute aortic dissection, would be a CT uh, because of that. Um, and then there's one more. Um, so if you're really concerned about aortic dissection, you get a test back and it doesn't quite fit with what you think is going on. Um, you should go on and do a second imaging uh, test to exclude dissection. So advantages of CT would be that it is non-invasive and usually readily available and fast. Cost is, is moderate compared to MRI or invasive angiography. It has great spatial resolution. We get these beautiful 3D images that you occasionally see on posters. Um, and it, um, compared to invasive angiography, which we used to do for dissection, it shows you not just the lumen, but also the wall or mural thrombus um, or calcified plaque. But it also gives you, if, if it wasn't the order, it gives you alternative diagnosis, which could be the reason of, not infrequently, are the reason for the acute chest pain, um, which is great. And CT is probably the best test for these um, um, wide spectrum of alternative diagnosis. Not all of them. But pulmonary embolism can be picked up with an aortic dissection CT, although it may not be tailored for that, at least if it's an important, big, proximal one. Uh, trauma, uh, rib fractures can be identified, pancreatitis, ischemic bowel, or pneumonia. We've seen uh, a number of cases where it turned out to just be a pneumonia and not a dissection. Or renal colic can all be picked up with your dissection protocol uh, CT. So in the, very, in the acute setting, CT would be uh, your test of choice. It has disadvantages. You do need radiation. 
Um, uh, you do need iodinated contrast, so some patients with renal failure or anaphylaxis to that contrast, which is rare, um, could not have it. Um, and there are some artifacts, uh, especially if you have uh, metal in your body. Um, so the acute aortic syndrome has more than um, uh, just uh, the dissection, um, aortic ulcer or intramural hematoma are part of that spectrum. Here, just some imaging example. This is a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. I would recommend to have a, a, a sur vascular surgical consultation because they get operated on depending on size and location. The risk is they can rupture and then you bleed into your thoracic cavity until, uh, well, until you're dead. You can bleed out because of <laughs> thoracic cavity is so big. So that, that would be a bad scenario. I definitely involve a surgeon. The intramural hematoma is best seen on a pre-contrast scan, which is part of the uh, CT for dissection. You can see the calcium, intimal calcification can be displaced medially. That's one of the signs. And you have this crescent-shaped, high-density uh, rim in the wall to tell you that. Now, they are also important, and people say they should be treated similar to a dissection. If it were in the ascending order, um, a lot of surgeons would take this patient to surgery. It wasn't me. Um, here is an example of a type B aortic dissection, where the dissection flaps happens to start distal to the left subclavian artery. There's some thrombos. You can see the true and the false lumen, both being perfused well. And lower down, in this case, both kidneys were well perfused. So this would be uh, treated uh, medically, as opposed to this case where the descending aorta doesn't have a flap, but the ascending does, uh, with a big fenestration here. So there's good contrast on both sides. But it's an ascending aortic dissection, a little bit of the flap going towards the ostium of the left main. This is a surgical lesion the same day. Um, there's a 1% to 2% mortality per hour for acute type A dissection, so not something to um, uh, wait around on. Okay, let's uh, switch in the last six minutes to the coronary arteries. Um, well, we have invasive angiography, right? Um, why do we need another test to look at the coronary arteries? Well, let's review what we've been doing across the nation. Uh, 660 hospitals in the big national data registry were reviewed by uh, some physicians from Duke, Manish Patel, and Pam Douglas. They're very prominent cardiologists. They just wanted to see what is the reality on the ground today. Are we using our cath labs appropriately? And they looked at patients um, that had no known history of coronary artery disease and had their first cath and said, what's the yield? How many of them really needed it? And they identified people that had no coronary artery disease, which they said less than 20% luminal narrowing, and found that 40% of people that go to the cath lab had what they called no coronary artery disease. Um, and then if you look at people that definitely don't need anything done, less than 50% narrowing, up to 49%, um, the total was 60%. So they said, well, there's 60% of people that go to the cath lab, which is really expensive, that didn't need to because there was nothing to be done. And they concluded that we need better strategy for risk stratification um, and to sort out people that need to go to the cath lab and people that don't need to go to the cath lab. So I'd like to invite you to help me see if CTA, these are two of our fellows, could be the gatekeeper to the cath lab. Okay, let's see. Let's start out with the accuracy of CT. Um, accuracy tests, uh, uh, studies, uh, there are a number out there, use invasive angiography as the gold standard. So they can't be wrong. Um, and CT is measured against it. And compared to all other non-invasive tests for uh, ischemia um, that basically look at the same thing, CT has the highest accuracy uh, uh, in terms of sensitivity and specificity and overall accuracy. The butamine stress echo has a higher sensitivity uh, than in uh, uh, this study, but the, excuse me, specificity, but the sensitivity of cardiac CT is very high. But more importantly, there are now literally hundreds of single center and multi center trials that have shown that the negative predictive value of CT is extremely high, unusually high for a medical test. Um, it's been shown throughout the world, many centers, academic, ivory towers, private practice places. So um, the negative predictive value is uh, in this study, in this large uh, multi-center trial, was 99%. So if you have a CT of the coronary arteries, and the reading was the images were diagnostic quality and negative, you can be 
99% certain that the patient doesn't have um, ischemia. Um, uh, there are, this is a coronary CT that's negative. There are a number of studies that not just said, um, well, it's negative compared to the gold standard. They looked at patients uh, up, to, up to five years after the CT and looked at the annual event rate. And the annual event rate in this setting is close to zero. So the most valuable information you can get is, well, it's a negative CT. If, if it is not negative, maybe you have a non-obstructive lesion or an obstructive lesion, it's a different story. But you can sort people out that are very low risk with close to zero event rate. Um, that can be very helpful if you're thinking, is it esophageal reflux or is it ischemia and the patient keeps coming back? Um, so if, if you do the CT, it's good quality and negative, um, you know your answer. Now, the prognostic value of CT is also extremely high, higher than any of the other risk stratification tests. It has incremental value over um, all other um, risk stratification uh, methods that we have. So these are Kaplan-Meier curves. Um, anybody above the curve has not survived. This is all-cause mortality. Um, and they look at normal, non-obstructive disease, one, two, or three vessel obstructive disease. You can see some of us get run over by a bus, right? So all-cause mortality after three years is never 100%. Um, if you have non-obstructive plaque, you double your risk of not being alive. And if you have one, two, or three vessel disease, there will be an additional maybe 5% of people that are not alive if you had three vessel disease by CT. This is very powerful prognostic value. Um, in CT. Um, how about in the acute setting? If you're coming to the emergency room, you're not ruled in, your first EKG is not diagnostic of an infarct, and your first enzymes are, say, negative. We have a lot of patients, um, five, five million uh, patients a year that come to EDs like that. Um, we would do serial enzymes, observe you, you would be here for probably uh, close to 24 hours. CT in the settings, in multiple and three prospective randomized multicenter trials has shown to reduce the time to final disposition, safely go home um, or uh, go on to be admitted by 50%. One trial didn't show cost savings, it was neutral, um, and a couple of others showed a cost, overall cost reduction by adding CT as a triage test um, early on there. So um, there is a role, this evidence is it, it hasn't been done, the guidelines are being done, but it would be good for level one um, evidence, class one um, evidence. There are multi-society guidelines, again, with the American College of Radiology and Cardiology and ACT Society, that came up with is now considered appropriate indications. Uh, there are seven or eight others that are not very common, but stable uh, suspected coronary artery disease with an intermediate likelihood is one. Um, acute chest pain, uh, 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 in the acute chest pain setting, as I described, is another one. If you are planning major surgery, not heart surgery, and you want to clear the coronaries before that, cardiac CT is a great test. And in anybody who had a bypass graft um, with, uh, uh, the, with, the, uh, with onset of new chest pain and you want to look for graft patency would be an appropriate indication for CT. All right, so uh, with that, I'm out of time, and I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>